for kids. Last week I talked about how Sunday is here in your finances. When you live for the Lord with your finances, God will meet your needs and bless you. And aren't those things that we worry about a lot? If you're a parent, how many of you worry about your kids? I'm raising my hand. I mean, you worry about your kids who don't serve the Lord, maybe, or kind of on the fence. Or how many of you worry about your finances? You know, can I pay the bills this week? Uh, and we worry a lot, don't we? There's a study that was done that the average American worries about a different circumstance three or four times a day. So, so they have three or four circumstances a day that they're actually worrying about. In the same study, they found that nine out of ten of those things that the average American worries about never happen. So they're worrying for no cause, no reason, Amen. nine out of ten of the times. And the, the one time out of ten that the event actually does happen that they're worrying about, does worrying change anything? No, it doesn't. Jesus said that you can't add one cubit, you can't grow taller by worrying about it. You know, if you're a little kid and you think, man, I want to be about two inches taller, I want to be like my brother or sister, uh, you can't grow just by worrying about it. You can maybe redo your hair and poof it up, but, but you can't grow by worrying about it. And the same thing, we don't change things by worrying about it. But what does worry do? It steals our joy, it steals our peace, it steals our confidence, it steals our hope. It steals so many things from our lives. You know, the NLT translates Matthew 6, 27. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And what worrying does is it steals moments from our life. It steals moments of joy. It steals moments with our family when we're grouchy about something. The smell steals moments from our lives because if you worry a lot, you're stressed out, and that causes hypertension, it causes digestive problems, and it weakens your immune system, so you actually die earlier. So worrying steals moments from our life. And Jesus told us not to worry, and turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And, and actually starting in verse 6. And Jesus here describes a formula through Paul the Apostle of how to deal with worry in our life. When we're worrying, how should we deal with worry? And I've talked about this many times, but it gives you an outline. And if you have uh, maybe a piece of paper or maybe your newsletter and want to write some notes down, that might be good. Verse 6. Don't worry about anything. That's a command. Don't worry about anything. But when you do worry, because we all do our, live in these physical bodies and we do worry from time to time, uh, pray about everything. Prayer is talking to God. So when you start worrying, immediately turn to God and start talking to God about it. That's point Amen. number one. Talk to God about what you're worrying about. And then tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So talk to God about your worries. And then the second point is Thank him for hearing and taking the concerns that you have on your heart. So you praise him for it. So first you talk to him about it, then you praise him for it. And it says in verse 7, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, how many of you have gone through the process where you start worrying, you talk to God about it, and then you thank him for taking it, and you have a, a peace for a moment, but then the worry comes back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we all do that. Our minds are just geared to worry, aren't they? And, and the worry comes back. But then it says in 4.8, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent or worthy and worthy of praise. And, and so it says, when the worries come back, we're to control our thoughts. Amen. So when we start worrying again, we've already given it to God. God knows what we uh, need, and he's working on our behalf already. And when, when the worries come back, we say, okay, I'm not going to think about this. I'm going to think about God's goodness. I'm going to think about how he's provided in the past. I'm going to think about what he's doing for me today. I'm going to think about these things, what's good. 
And, and when you start thinking about what's good, you start worshiping and praising God. And it's hard to worry when you worship, isn't it? Now here, God gives us three points to uh, help overcome worry. We talk to him about it. We thank him for it. We control our thoughts. And in, in verse 9, he gives one more, a fourth point. Keep putting into practice all you learn and receive from me. So the Bible, That's begin true. to put in practice in your life what God teaches us in the word of God. So those four points, you'll overcome worry. Now, over, turn over with me now to Matthew chapter 6. And this is where I'm going to take the main part of the message today. That was just kind of an introduction. And that introduction is repeated in a different form by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and how to overcome worry. And thank you, Jimmy, for reading the word of God so excellently. But it says in verse 25, Jesus tells us, and look at the scripture. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to drink uh, and drink, enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? So here is a God commanding through Jesus Christ again, don't worry. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, don't worry. Now turn to your other neighbor and tell him or her, don't worry. When God repeats something in, the, in his word, it's something very important for us to understand. And God repeats several times in his word, don't worry, because he knows us. He created us, and he knows that we have a tendency to worry, and he doesn't want us to worry, but, but he wants us to live in joy. He wants us to live in victory. He wants to live as overcomers, and he wants us to be about doing what he's called us to do. So he says, stop worrying. Amen. And this is how to deal with it. So, verse 25, he says, stop worrying. Now, verse 26, he starts to redirect our focus. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to them than they are? Can all your words, worries add a single moment to your life? And then, and then he goes... And why worry about your clothing in verse 28? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow and don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. What did Jesus do there? He redirected our focus in one sense from the circumstances that are causing the worry to his magnificent creation. Amen. You know, nothing like a good walk in nature to get you focused on God's greatness. Isn't it? Amen. They did a study one time that if you do walk 20 minutes in nature, that you'll be less stressed. They probably spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on it. And uh, it's something that's kind of the Bible teaches and we kind of know intuitively that if you, if you get out of your house and walk, on, you know, go to the wild preserve over on uh, near K and L and over in the 40th Street West in that area, walk in nature. Get out and walk around the block and just look at God's wonderful creation and it will lessen your stress and you'll not worry as much uh, because uh, we'll recognize how great and good God is. In Psalms 19 verses 1 and 2 it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. And I love this because we're looking at nature, God's wonderful creation. And it says, for the choir director, for Karen, our worship leader, sing this song. Lead us in this song. Let us lift our voices and worship the Lord about his goodness and his greatness. I mentioned earlier that when we make our requests known to God with thanksgiving, that we're to worship the Lord. And you cannot be worrying when you're worshiping. And so get out in nature and begin to say, God, thank you for your wonderful creation. You are so good. 
Thank you for the beautiful poppies that we get to see for a month. And hopefully it'll rain this Thursday, so it'll last a couple more weeks. And, and, we, and we begin to thank God for his beautiful creation. Because if the God of the universe that spoke the universe into right. existence. And he said, I also noticed about this when he says, look at the birds and the, the, the uh, flowers. As God is about detail. Jesus said, look at the detail. Have you ever gone out and just studied a flower? Don and I went out, uh, you know, recently, a couple of weeks, we took little trips out to the poppy fields, and there would be photographers down on the ground with their camera on one flower. How many of you have done that? You got your, yeah. And you just study that one, and the beauty of that one flower, and the detail. God is a God of detail. And the detail we see in creation, Amen. God is a God of detail in your life. Yes. And he cares for the little things in your life. Amen. I was talking to someone this week that I don't, he, the person said to me, I don't come to God with all my, everything on my heart because you think of it, 8 billion people asking God all the time. And I thought, wow, I think God's a little bigger than that. God who spoke the universe into existence, right. 8 billion people talking to him at one time does not overwhelm God. There could be 80 billion, 800 billion, 8 trillion people and would still not overwhelm God because God cares about the details of each of our lives. He cares about the details of your life. And if he provides food for the birds and if he clothes the flowers how much will you take care of the details in your life? That's right. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? Yes. We live in Friday when Sunday is here. And you're a child of the Most High God. And God cares about everything that's going on in your life. And he has not forgotten you. Sometimes we think he's forgotten us, but he has not forgotten you. And I love it where, when he's talking about the birds, aren't you more valuable? Aren't you more valuable? God created the birds and the flowers for our enjoyment. And he, he created us for his enjoyment. And so we are so much more valuable than his creation because he created us for relationship. And he, he's going to take care of you. He's going to uh, be there for you. And sometimes, sometimes we, uh, we forget that. Um, in Matthew 6.30, where Jesus said, and if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he certainly care for you? Why do you have so little faith? Why do you have so little faith? Turn with me over to Luke 17, 6. We'll come back to Matthew 6. But turn with me to Luke 17 and verse 6. And I want to kind of walk through this a little bit with you. In uh, verse 5, the disciples asked Jesus to show them, how can we increase our faith? How many of you have asked God to increase your faith? He said, God, give me more faith. I don't feel like I have enough faith. And, and Jesus responds with this answer. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. How big is a mustard seed? It must be small. It is it's real small, yes. Yes, it's really, really small. It's, it's about, I don't know, uh, one millimeter in diameter. It's small. It's one of the smaller seeds. And Jesus was telling his disciples, it doesn't matter how big or how little your faith is. Just a little bit of faith. You see, God can do a lot with a little. You don't need more faith. You just need to put into practice the little bit of faith you have. 
And Jesus illustrated that by saying this. He said, okay, after he said, you know, yeah, faith is a mustard seed, he says, when a servant comes in from plowing or taking, now, now I want to preface this, this sounds harsh, but listen to this. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal and put on your apron and serve me while I eat, then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. Now that sounds harsh, doesn't it? Like, man, you, you work for me, the God all day, and then at the end of the day, you serve him your meal, and then you can rest. And now, God isn't saying he's like this, but he's saying a principle here. If you want to increase your faith, do your duty. Come on. If you want to grow your faith, Amen. Do what I've called you to do Amen. in your life. Because a lot of times we want more faith and we're praying at the altar, praying at the side of our bed and asking God for more faith. And we're not going to get more faith by, by just being on our knees. We are to ask God for more faith, but then how our faith grows is we get out and do what he's called us to do. Amen. Our faith grows as we put into practice and plant that mustard seed in the ground. See, seeds don't grow unless they're planted in the ground. That's right. And for our faith to grow, we have to go out and plant the seed of faith that he's given us in the ground, in the soil of this earth, in the hearts of men and women, so then it can grow and it will produce fruit in their lives and in our lives. I've seen, you know, Pentecost Sunday is coming up. I was talking with someone recently about Pentecost Sunday, and that's the the anniversary of the day that the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples and they spoke in tongues in Jerusalem and the church was birthed. It's, it's a fantastic day. But the disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they, but their faith would not have grown if they had stayed in the prayer room. If they stayed in the prayer room, that flame would have went out. They had to get out and they had to walk up to the temple and see the lame man at the side of the steps up to the temple. And then they practiced their faith and they planted a seed in that lame man and he stood up and he walked. Amen. And as they went about and did what God called them to do, <laughs> watch out. They begin to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. You don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit in a prayer room. That's you right. operate in the gifts of the Spirit as you go out and pray for people. Right. Yeah. So put into practice yeah. your faith and it will grow. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. This past week, um, Donna, we're at a, a minister's conference out of town. It's an annual meeting of the Assembly of God Ministers in Southern California, and we have business sessions. We vote on leaders for our, our denomination. We, um, we have church services, worship services. We honor uh, new ministers who are getting their license. We recognize ministers who have passed away or served for a long time. And it's just a wonderful time. And uh, Thursday morning was a service I was looking forward to. It was a prayer service. It was a time when we were, it was concerted prayer. But, I mean, Thursday morning was the prayer service. Wednesday night, uh, we were leaving the hotel, and I was uh, on a road, uh, one of the, you know, driveways for the hotel, and a car came around the corner quick, and so I had to kind of pull over, and, and so we wouldn't hit, and I pulled over kind of farther right, so we had avoided each other, and there was a, a drain that had a huge dip in it. And if you know Donna's car, it has a very low clearance. So there's, it was unavoidable. I hit that dip too hard, and the undercarriage, the undercover that covers the bottom of the engine, it hit hard, and the, the grommets that hold it in place popped out. And so the thing fell down. Great. Here I'm at a conference. Now, that's not a hard thing to fix, but I don't have any tools with me. And here I'm at a conference. I, I, there's no way I can fix it unless I take it somewhere to fix it. So I thought, oh, this is good. And so I drove it back into the parking lot of the hotel. And then I thought, well, I'll deal with it in the morning because it was late night. And I thought, well, I'm going to miss all day. So, But I was praying about it. And I say, Lord, I know you're going to take care of this. 
And honestly, I'm not making this up. I worry sometimes, but this time I really wasn't worried. I said, Lord, um, what, why did this happen? Uh, is there someone you want me to meet? Is there a divine appointment? And I felt the security guard. In my mind, I felt the security guard. Well, I did my due diligence. I made an appointment at a, um, at a shop. And uh, the next morning I got there, I had contact with the hotel, and they were going to send a security guard down just to touch base with me. But he hadn't shown up. So I was getting ready to call AAA. And for some reason, every time I dialed the number, it went to the salesman phone number where they were trying to sell me something. And so I just hang up and try and dial again and hang up and try and dial. And, and I was getting ready the third time to call. And about that time, the security guard showed up. And so I started to talk to the security guard. And I just asked him, hey, do you have any, do you have a jack here? And he says, well, I don't know. And so we walked over to their maintenance and he talked to the maintenance people. And they said, oh, yeah, we have a car jack here. And I said, do you happen to have some zip ties? And he said, oh, yeah, we have some zip ties. And so we walked back together, and we were carrying on conversation, getting to know each other and stuff, and it just took a few minutes to jack the car up and zip tie the thing in place to, until we can get the, actually, you know, the right things in there. And, uh, and then I said, why don't you put the jack in the back of the car, and I'll drive you over to the maintenance yard. And so we did, and we were chatting, and before we broke, I said, is there anything I can pray with you about? And in the conversation, I don't know why I was at the hotel, and he knew I was a pastor. And he broke down and says, I've really messed things up. And it opened the door for us to talk and for me to pray with this yeah. man and kind of help to point him in, in a good direction. And God had a divine appointment for me to interact with that, that gentleman. It, it, it interrupted my day a little bit. I could go to a prayer service. I agree we should go to prayer service. I'm not knocking that at all. But I couldn't go to the prayer service. I had to go out and do the work of the ministry. And, and if I had been griping and complaining to God That's right. because of my, the interruption, and, you know, I could have gone down the grant gamut. The thing popped off because the last time I got the oil change, it didn't put all the grommets back in. They only put one, maybe two in. So it wasn't holding it properly. I could have gotten mad at them. I am going to go talk to them, but I'm not mad at them. But, but uh, I, I could have been upset because that car came around the corner too tight and it, I had to go over to the right. I could have been upset about all these things. I could have gotten mad. I could have worried, how am I going to get this fixed? What's going to happen? I mean, I've got my whole day's around. I could have worried about all that stuff. Amen. But Romans 8, 28 says, for all things, That's right. some things, Hallelujah. some things, yes. some things, yes. all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Do you love the Lord? Yes. Are you called according to his purposes yes. in your life? then all things work together for our good. Yes, it does. The circumstances that come in our life that we think, why did this happen to me? Lord, what are you doing to me now? Can work together for our good when we yes. turn to the Lord and surrender them to the Lord and say, Lord, what do you have for me to do? Amen. we got to stop worrying and start doing. That's right. God has so much for us and we fall so short because we worry about food, yes. we worry about clothing, we worry about the things of this world. Yes. God's going to take care of those things in your life. Yes, he is. But he says, look at 633. He says this, seek the kingdom of God above all else. First he commands us, don't worry. And then he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Amen. What is the kingdom of God? Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us what it is in the Lord's Prayer. If you look just up a few verses in the same chapter. Look at, look at verse uh, 9. This is, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually the disciples' prayer where God, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And pray like this, he says, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. And then what's verse 10 say? May your kingdom, may thy kingdom come. And what? Your will be done. Where? On earth. That's the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God is the will of God being accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God is the kingdom of God. The will of God is the rule of God. And we, as the children of God, as what the Bible calls ambassadors who are to go into this world and share the kingdom of God, we are to personally submit to the rule of God in our life. Yes. And we are going to seek the rule of God in this world and in the hearts of people. What's God say he wants? He says, I don't want anyone to perish That's right. or be destroyed, but all yes. to be saved. Yes. That is the will of God. That is. So we need to have that, that motivation as we walk through this earth. God in our life, if we want to experience joy, if we want to overcome the worries of life, if we want to have victory in the circumstances of life, we need to personally submit to the will of God in our yes. life. And the word says, seek his righteousness. It doesn't mean you're perfect. How many of you are perfect? I saw a hand go halfway up, and that's probably right. Because in Christ, we are perfect. In Christ, in the sight of God, he sees us as we are in our glorified bodies, and he sees us perfect today. So in the sight of God, we are perfect because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed us away of all our sins so we can come into the presence of God. But actually, we are not perfect yet. Because this week, and you can raise how many of you sinned this week? Okay. Maybe not all of you, but... I mean, we're not perfect. We're, we're in process. But the Bible says our attitude, just as we seek the kingdom of God, we need to seek his righteousness. That means we don't settle for sin in our life. We don't accept it in our life. Oh, that's just the way I am. Or I can justify this in my life because X, Y, Z. I can't afford I, we got to live together because I can't afford to live separate and honor God. And God says, if you can't control yourselves, get married. Get married. God doesn't, I mean, get married. God's provided a way for you to honor him. Um, if you let anger control your life, God says, no. Turn it over to me. Talk to me about it. Control your anger. If, if you lie, no, that's, that's not okay. Ask God's forgiveness when you lie and say, God, help me not to lie next time. That's right. Man. If, if you... Yeah, and the list can go on and on, can it? And, and I'm not judging any of you because we all fall in those categories. Every one of us fall into those categories. So I'm not judging you if you're here and fell into one of those categories. What I'm doing is I'm trying to encourage you. God has so much more for us in this life. He Amen. wants to bless you abundantly. He wants yes, you to be yes. filled with joy. He wants to bless you so that you're being a blessing to other people. And for us to do that, we have to seek first his kingdom. And then we have to seek his righteousness in our life. And as we do that, uh, I'll tell you, it'll, it'll open up a new chapter in your life of victory, of joy, of peace, of, of abundance in so many ways. And Jesus doesn't want us to live under the circumstances. That's right. He wants us to live above the circumstances. Yes, yes, and for us to live above the circumstances, we got to not let the circumstances control us. And we have to say, Lord, what do you want to do through this circumstance? And thank you that I know you're working it together for my good, that you're going to provide, you're going to take care of me. And Lord, what can I do to seek first your kingdom and seek your righteousness in my life? So don't worry. Talk to God about it. Thank him for it. Control your thinking. And then get busy doing what he's called you to do because he has a lot of great things for you. I, I love Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 